and we can get kick it off and people can keep joining. So welcome everyone. If you've been with us for the previous sessions, thanks so much for um, continuing to come to our full exploration of this topic. Um, this is the final discussion. It was a five week series um, about the book, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind and Body in the Healing of Trauma by Be Bessel van der Kolk. So I'm Sarah Maloney. I'm the manager of research and technology at the St. Joseph County Public Library. And I just have to say one more time, um, a huge thank you to everyone from um, who has been working with me on this. So we have Dan Dr. Nancy Michael on the call tonight, leading us tonight um, from Notre Dame Neuroscience and Behavior Department. Um, we've had we have um, Becky Zakowski here from uh, Oaklawn, who's been joining us. We also had Kimberly Green Reeves from. Beacon Community Impact. We had Velshana Lucky from United Way helping us. And Dory Lawrence from Oaklawn was also on our team. So I just have to say thank you one more time to everyone. Um, we do have recordings of the past sessions available. So I'm just gonna put the link there in case you missed any and you wanna catch up. Um, and we'll have this session recording posted there as well. So that's about all I've got. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy. Just let me know if you have any questions, send them over in the chat. All right. And yeah, I wanna I wanna reiterate Sarah's thanks and gratitude, right? Like this was this was a this was a heavy lift, right? Like I think a heavy lift for organizing, heavy lift for participants to to keep coming back. Um, and just just thanks, thanks for that. Um, this is our final session. And so the the idea behind offering the final session was really to to like kind of put it put all of this that we've talked about in an actionable context for ourselves and for our community. Um, and so, so this really is, um, right, the idea that, that we can take what we've learned from this book and move from trauma-aware to trauma-informed as a community through a community coalition, right? Like it's not owned by any one person, um, but it's owned by all of us collectively and we, we all take part in, in what, we can, what we can create together. And a big part of this, I think, also is this idea of growing through difficulty. Um, 2020 <laughs> has been a heck of a year, right? Like, and it's not done and we'll continue into 2021. But, but if we become defeated by 2020, like, like we don't, like, what do we, what do we learn? And so, so today is kind of also a framework of like this idea that we, that we become resilient we become stronger when we choose to grow through. And that it means kind of like recognizing the harm and recognizing the hurt and, and this, this kind of vulnerable and courageous state of saying like, this has been really hard and I need help, but together we will become stronger because of, right? So, so growing through difficulty. Um, I was, was told, I did a, a talk with Oakland on Friday and uh, I was told that some people participated in both the book club as well as the um, as well as the Oakland series. So so please engage. Um, there's going to be some redundancy, but but the this I really like. So this was a piece that came out of that Oakland um, Oakland series from their from their guest speaker, and it's this tiny trauma stewardship institute's tiny survival guide, right? And and these are just like little right these little one off kinds of things, right? Like this idea of just nurturing gratitude or cultivating relationships or being active, right? This, this definitely fits in line with a lot of the things that we've talked about, um, just in terms of, of meeting what we have talked about as meeting species, expectance, experiences, right? There's not a single thing on here. So my bias is declared on this, right? Like my bio bias is that neuroscience can help. And so if you look, if you dig deep into the data behind every single one of these rec recommendations, you're gonna find some evidence from neuroscience in terms of like, if you do this, it helps keep the nervous system healthy, right? If you do this, it meets the nervous system expectation of attachment. If you do this, it meets the nervous system expectation of movement, right? All of these, all of these things, right? In terms of translation and talking about neuroscience, Clearly, not everybody is going to be down for reading a 300, 400 page book, right? And like digging further deeper into the technical details, right? So, so we come up with these infographics, right? How, how do we communicate the important pieces 
but also maintain the fidelity of what's behind them so they don't get turned into a meme or they don't get turned into some, I don't know, some piece that people end up arguing over. Um, but I believe that neuroscience can help, right? And, and that all of this is behind or with the idea that, that if we continue to work together, right? Every single person on this call has a different specialty or domain, right? None of us has the same expertise and we will never solve complex community problems if we all have the same background. It's just not possible. So offering a lofty goal of creating a self-healing community in our community, within St. Joseph County, within Elkhart, within the Michiana region, what does it look like, right? We learned a lot from the book that, that at the core of human needs are strong and trusting relationship. We require hope, we require personal autonomy, this perceived self-control. And self-healing communities really, right? It's, it's how, how do you get the word out about that? We have so many social narratives that restricts our capacity to care for one another, right? If you think about even something as what has become as ubiquitous as divorce, what do we tell our kids socially, right? Not if they end up in therapy, right? It, it happens to everybody, right? So, so even there, you know, there's just this increasing distance in terms of social narrative that continues to kind of, kind of, kind of restricts or disregard the fact that at the core, the basic essence of human needs are these deep and trusting relationships. So the simplest way to talk about self-healing communities is where community members have the skills and the knowledge and the prerequisites understanding to take care of themselves so that we can take care of other people. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves, then we're tired and spread thin and thinned and exhausted we lose our tempers, right? If we're not taking care of ourselves. We diminish our capacity to care for others. And this is all in the context of species expectant experiences. What are the actual kind of needs of the neurobiological system? So quick brainstorm. I'm pretty sure we did this. It might've been five weeks ago, <laughs> right? So we can, we all know each other. We're a smaller group tonight. I'm going to invite everybody to like unmute and be like, Hey, how do we get here? Right? What did humans need to do to survive? This shall all be review. Ready? Go. Safety. Safety. Absolutely. Yep. Community. Community. Trust. Trust. Defense protection. Defense and protection. Yep. What are some like basic need things? Food. Yeah. Food, food. sleep, water. Sleep. It's water. Shelter. Yep, absolutely. So we had to eat and drink, right? In order to do so, right? So again, I want you guys to be remembering this, this kind of thing, right? Let's let let's look to this. And here we go. Moving on our way. Eat, drink. We had to move, right? There is a species expectant experience that we ambulate, that we walk around a lot, right? Like it doesn't have to be CrossFit, but we do our, our nervous system and our physiology actually expects to be outside moving, right? In order to obtain food, we had to do a tremendous amount of problem solving. We had to do, uh, we had to endure failure because animals weren't always in the same places. We couldn't always grow crop. Well, we didn't grow crops until like 12,000 years ago, but we, right? like weather patterns changed and rain changed and water sources would, would change. Inevitably we endured failure, which developed resilience because as everybody on this call talked about, right? We, we were in a tribe, right? We, had, we were hungry. We had to store, we would store fat. We evolved the ability to store fat, right? This has been another thing. We become hungry long before we have a caloric need right, which has become a health concern in modern communities, right, at least in the in Western culture has become a health concern with, but it started off as this evolutionary adaptation to endure times of famine and endure times where resources were scarce. We absolutely had to have shelter. We had to reproduce, right? This will be a book series for another time when we talk about adolescent phenotypes and the drive to leave the cave, uh, but that is not a conversation for today. 
And ultimately, all of this required, we touched on it so many times, this idea of community and relationships. We would never have survived without community and relationships helping us to obtain all of these things. And I just want us to take a moment, if you have something to write with, if you have, if you have like, you know, you can type, you can write paper and pencil, right? So if, if that is right, when we talk about species expectant experiences, right? It was kind of this, this very, very long view of what it means to be human that created the pressures that drove the, the evolution of species expectant experiences. We don't often live in or think about this long view of what humans need, right? We are very, very much socialized by marketing, by social media, by television, by friends, by newspapers. So let's just take 30 seconds and right when I talk about the distance, what is the distance between? So think about some of these species expected experiences and the distance between the expectation and kind of the social narrative around the way that we live our lives now, whether it's takeout on Fridays or taco Tuesdays, or I'll get to it next week or new year's resolutions. Does that make sense? Ready, 30 seconds, go. All right, what are some things that people came up with? Where, where do we notice distance between species expectant experience and social narrative or marketing narrative, really? Um, one that seems pretty obvious to me is like um, the need for reproduction versus like romantic love. Is that what you're getting at? I mean, that, that, is, that is a great example, yeah, right? So like, like uh, right, <laughs> there we have, we have lots of cultural ways to describe love with the, but the ultimate goal is reproducing, right? And I, and I make very um, perhaps off color jokes with my nephews who are coming of age, um, right? That like, when we ask about things like, and I, I know that this might not be the appropriate place, but like the intended consequence of sex is, reproduction right so if you're not ready to have a baby let's think about your choices right <laughs> anyway um yeah that's 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 the intended consequence but we don't ever we right we don't we don't talk about that because in the united states of america sex is actually something that is really culturally right we don't we're not comfortable talking about sex because it's this almost like taboo we see it everywhere like it's in our faces all the time in magazines and television shows, uh, the way that your pictures and you know are posted and advertisements are created, but we're not allowed to talk about it. So talk about an unhealthy relationship with bodies, with intimacy, with the actual act of sex and what that may or may not look like. With She froze up. She she doesn't want to talk about sex so much that her screen froze. <laughs> it's just so, too awkward. Yeah, let's see if she can come back in. Shoot. I bet she'll have to sign back in. Yeah, I bet she'll come right back. Yeah. It it's a good time. facial screenshot for her. We should take that. <laughs> I thought my internet dropped. I'm like, oh. Nancy's moving now. Yeah, she's coming back in. Oh, good. Oh, you're okay. muted. Dr. Michael, you're muted. So sorry about that. We have, um, we have like our home internet and then the Xfinity internet, right? And the Xfinity internet always steals my wireless signal and is not broadband strength or high speed strength or whatever. So my apologies about that. We Here just we thought you were embarrassed to talk about sex more. So you just stopped talking. Yeah, exactly. 
So Dr. Michael, along those same lines, I was kind of thinking about even the reproduction and even just the movement aspect. You know, when people are starting to date now and things you can do dating, even from online at home, you know, yeah. um, and as far as the movement aspect, kids aren't going outside as much because they're always on devices. So how much technology has kind of, you know, played into all of that. Um, yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. Technology is a huge, right. And so again, we don't often think about the, the long game of human need and human expectation because we're just socialized. We, we jump in at a particular point. Thanks. I know I, I see Anne on the line, right? As I learned, there's there's not only a current within organizations that drive culture and drive the way that we do things, but there's a very, very strong currents within culture that drive narrative, that drive behaviors, right? And marketing is such a powerful influencer of the direction of that, right? And now with the inter introduction of social media as well, right, there are... Um, what are the pressures that kids are under in terms of how are they able to engage? How are they expected to engage? Um, right, again, a great deal of distance exists for this generation, for the generation that probably came right before them. I think it was like two years ago. So the, the children that have grown up with kind of ubiquitous cell phone use for their entire lifetimes, I think are probably graduating high school-ish about right now. So what are the differences, right? We have um, pediatric occupational therapists. We have children that are growing up in the absence of the, the, the physical experience that's necessary to develop vestibular and proprioceptive awareness of their own bodies, right? Which is one of the factors that likely contribute, I can't say causes, but likely contributes to these increases in kind of these behavioral disturbances, things like ADHD, the inability to sit still is because again, the nervous system is not getting what it expects from the world around it, right? And so you know, we I can develop testify to that, Dr. Michael, just like in the past 20 years, I've kind of been doing, you know, social work in our area, and especially in the school system. And we have seen such an increase in those kind of, you know, eligibilities for behavior, for autism, for OHI, for ADHD, all that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So seeing it with my own eyes, how it's evolved with yeah, the introduction of technology. Yeah, very, very anecdotal. Well, and, I, with them. and I think the kids, um, and this is showing my age, but with the social media, the kids feel like there's a huge connection, but what they're missing is the physical face-to-face -face connection. And I do some mentoring on the West side. Every kid hated school. Every kid hates school until we told them in March, they couldn't go to school. They wanted to be in school because of the social interaction. So they're on their devices and they're connected, but that is so different than having a physical face-to-face -face for a lot of reasons. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. It's hugely different than having, having a physical face-to-face -face for, for so many reasons, right? We talked about a lot before I share this screen, um, right? What are, the, what are the major neurotransmitter systems that we've talked about? There are two that I'm super biased about. Do you remember? It's been a long the time. amygdala? Is that they one both, one? They both influence the function of the amygdala, yep. Serotonin and dopamine. So close, I don't actually, serotonin I know is important. I know very little about it. So my bias in all of these conversations are with oxytocin and dopamine, right? And so oxytocin, oxytocin is abbreviated OT, but that's like, um, we're gonna say trust, relationship, feelings of like altru altruism, trust, relationship, altruism. So oxytocin gets like the popular press, uh, it's the cuddle hormone, right? The love hormone. And then dopamine is behavioral, behavioral reinforcement, right? And so, and so dopamine, right, we talk about a lot is the reward circuitry. Um, it gets a lot of popular press for the, in, in the drugs of abuse literature, right? So release of dopamine into a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens is the common endpoint of activation for all addictive substances, right? So, but the thing is, is that oxytocin, why oxytocin becomes so important is that oxytocin is able to modulate dopamine. So when you have coincident activation of oxytocin and dopamine, it is just about the most reinforcing stimulus and right for in terms of behavioral re 
behavioral reinforcements that, that humans have, right? Because of the, the coincident activation of these two things and oxytocin has a very privileged position in, in modulating the dopaminergic signal, right? So in the absence of relationship, right? In the absence of this coincidence, all we have to go on for behavioral reinforcement is dopamine, which is when devices, when drugs of abuse, when shopping, when gambling, when all of those things, all those behaviors that can re result in what's called a phasic release, right? This big dump of dopamine, that's when those types of behaviors become addicting because there's no normative experience to counterbalance what we would call saliency or the importance across the central nervous system. So all we have to consolidate is the dopamine signal in the absence of oxytocin and then we get into a tremendous amount of trouble. The vulnerabilities that are introduced in the nervous system are remarkable um, in, when, when we eliminate oxytocin's ability to work within the system. Um, so in terms of species expectant experiences then, right? I mean, we've talked about this a lot. So we, we know that species expectant experiences were driven by a long game of human behavior. So what are some of them? So what? So based on based on what we what we kind of have talked about, what are some of these expected experiences for a developing nervous system? Let's start there. We're a small group, man. We can all be courageous and just unmute and shout stuff out. Serve and response. Yep, serve and return. Absolutely. And remember, developing serve and return. That's how we talk about it. Developed, still need it. We call it behavioral synchrony when we're grown up, right? This idea that you and I engage in coordinated and responsive dialogue, relationship, body language, right? We don't outgrow serve and return. It just looks different, but the need is still very much there no matter how old we get. What else? Imitation. Imitation. So, so like mentor, men, we'll call mentorship maybe? right? That for developing, we need somebody to, to copy. And no matter how old we get, I still need somebody who knows more, who's been in the system longer to help me figure out and navigate my way around. And I'm expected to do the same. My role is also to do the same for people that come after me. Yep. What else? We've talked about a little bit else, right? So this, we've touched on this idea, this consistent and attachment, attentive attachment figure, environmental complexity, right? Let's go back to this guy for a second. Hold on, let me find him. Let's go back to this guy for a second. I bet species expecting experiences, protect your mornings, stress reducer, go outside, species environmental complexity, be active, environmental complexity, Cultivate relationships, secure attachment, nurture gratitude, secure attachment, detox. I don't know, all of the above, right? Like don't put drugs in your body. <laughs> Spend time with animals, environmental complexity. Metabolize your experience, that means move, right? Environmental complexity. Simplify uh, stress reduction, right? Because again, from a, from a historical long game perspective, we talked to a neighbor, a friend of my daughter's earlier today, who was talking about the schedule that they keep, that they were on their way, they drive up to Niles four nights a week and then again on Saturdays for volleyball. They're gone from their house from 4.30 until about 6.30 or seven for a seven and a 10 year old's after school activities. Let's just let that sink in in terms of, in terms of what that does from a species expect and experience standpoint, right? And this is not an this is not atypical. This is a very typical pattern of behavior in resourced families in 2020. Environmental complexity, serve and return. I do something, you respond, it grows up with us. And again, complex social environments. These things we never ever grow out of. They just change the way as we as we age. Okay, but the question really is, right? We've talked a lot about in the context of the book, we've talked a lot about deprivation and threat specifically, 
when we deprive the nervous system of these experiences or when these experiences are threatened in some way. And oftentimes it's hard to parse those things out. But I think we can also consider, right? I work at Notre Dame. I have uh, tremendously gifted students. Very, very easy to forget what an average 18 to 22 year old looks like, right? Work with some tremendously gifted and remarkable humans um, who have been continually pushed to do more and more and more and more and more. And that is also not a sustainable practice. That is also a great distance. So that right back to that, uh, you know, the life hacks, right? That simplify idea that, that you can only do more and more and more and more and more to a point and then you break. Because again, from a long game perspective, the game was not to be busy from the time that you wake up until the time that you go to bed and only get four hours of sleep. The game was set by walking around outside for about six hours a day, every day for forever with some of the people that knew you best and you knew best to get the food that you needed. You lived in a community that was close enough that if you had enough and people didn't have any, you would share and they would do the same for you. And you did this kind of ad nauseum for tens of thousands of years, right? That is kind of, the, that's kind of like what I would consider the sweet spot. It was not that life was without adversity. Human life has always been hard, but that is how all of these things that we value so much about being human, right? It's the combination of the adversity with that remarkably strong support that then cultivates our greatest human capacity for care and mentorship and skill and survival, right? All of these different things. Well, you mentioned that, and then I, I wonder, um, you know, with this group, and, and Becky has done a tremendous job of bringing together a, a lot of groups and like-minded people for St. Joe County Cares, and then I look and see what happened in our community this past weekend, and it's torturous. And I, I think it's a challenge for all of us to figure out how do we integrate this in society, because as you point out, having the book knowledge is great. But there's so many challenges that we have just within our own community that is tearing apart our youth yeah. and we don't have an answer for it yeah. or we have an answer but we can't put it into practice yeah yeah and I, and I hope that, that that becomes a little bit more about what what tonight is about right is that is that we have all this knowledge um so how do we put it into and how do we put it into practice in a, in a really practical kind of way where it's not about people figuring out how to access resources. But again, from a, from a self-healing communities perspective, like, like who do we need to engage and right? Who at the Charles Black Center can we, can we bring in or who, what, what neighborhood leader is there or what faith leader is there, right? That, that, that I think um, 2020 has um, created an environment in which we can no longer ignore the inequities that have been present for centuries, right? It's because we have ignored so many issues for people that exist outside of, a dom out of, outside of the kind of the white dominant majority that, and, and then we've completely destabilized, right? We've destabilized the economy, we've destabilized school, we've destabilized food, we've destabilized, right? There is no going back to what life before coronavirus and George Floyd murder looks like. Right? We're not going to. And so, so my, my hope is that, that, Tom, you're exactly right. It is heartbreaking. I love this community, but it is not surprising. It is not surprising. Like if you look at, if we're honest about history, Right? Not history from history class, but if we're honest about history, where we are at right now is not surprising. So, so, how, so how do we do things differently? Right? One of the reasons I love neuroscience so much is that I feel like it allows us or enables us to sidestep. Right? So here's this, right? how does all this different stuff, distance between expectation and experience, the stress dose, the absence of protective factors, 
is when stress dose becomes trauma, right? When we get to talk about nervous system expectation, it allows us to sidestep value judgment in a way that when we start talking about, I don't know, public health crises or racism or religious freedom or LGBTQ rights, right? Like, like all of those social issues have a valence. And depending on your background, that valence can create a great distance between members of our community, right? But if we get to talk about species, right? If we talk about ex the expectant experiences of the nervous system, we get to talk about the nervous system just needs you to show up for it, man, right? Like, like and, and, and divorce, it does happen. And isn't that heartbreaking? Because, and it's not so much the divorce, but it's the animosity it's the anger, it's that vitriol nature that's associated with so many divorces. It's the fact that most of us don't have extended family or strong community networks of support that when our family goes through a divorce, kids are kind of left, they're kind of left, right? So, so how can we how, do we, how do we take what we understand about nervous system development and nervous system expectation and engage differently and it's okay despite what social media and all the political campaigning might say right now it's okay if we have different views on a social issue but i am a member of this community and you are a member of this community and man don't we want our community to be okay right luckily i think most nervous systems develop in spaces that are more typical than not. So when we talk about resiliency, right? Resiliency really is not, it's not the absence of adversity. It's, it's the balance, right? And so, and so in, in a teeter-totter kind of world, right? Adversity versus protective factors, where do we balance out? And we can overcome as a species, as humans, we can overcome a tremendous amount of adversity with strong protective factors on board. But one of the, our, um, I don't know, right? We talked about distance. I think in 2020 has allowed us to, um, beyond any reasonable doubt, 2020 has taught us that there is too much distance between the expectant experiences and the way we're actually living, right? For gen right? <laughs> generations, didn't used to be like this, right? I don't know what's going on with these kids. These kids are crazy, right? <laughs> it wasn't like this when I was growing up, right? And and we right we we use these. It's it's our it's our culture, right? Because we're part of a social system. We're socialized. It's not a value judgment on anybody, right? We, we, when we live, when we get to grow up in, in typical environments, we do okay, right? Low deprivation, low threats. Also the suggestion of some kind of nurturing attachment figure. High deprivation, high threat. Oftentimes, right? It's really difficult to parse these things out because they often coexist, right? But again, again, the distance, species expecting experience, actual experience, protective factors or not, equals stress dose. And that's really where the ACEs study comes in. How many people, I know that there are a couple of people without their cameras on. How many people have heard ACEs study? Nodding, a couple, okay. ACEs study, right, was a really seminal study published in 1989, looking at, so there was this guy, Dr. Anda um, and uh, Vincent Folletti. Uh, one, Anna was at CDC, Folletti was at Kaiser Permanente Healthcare System in Southern California, right? And so they were, one somebody studied smoking cessation, the other studied obesity, and they met at a conference and they're like, man, <laughs> we're giving our patients all kind of data <laughs> and they're still smoking and they're not losing weight. What's going on, right? So talk about the courage to look at things differently, right? The medical community, the scientific community is very curmudgeon -y. I'm allowed to say it because I was raised in there right? We don't like feelings. We don't like to touch people, right? We're not going to give you a hug. If you don't understand science, then you're probably not smart enough to be a scientist, right? Like those are, those are, the, those are the implicit and often explicit social narratives that you're raised around in the sciences, right? 
So let's talk about the courage that it took these two guys. And look, right, so power and privilege. Anda was like the head of the CDC and Folletti was like the head of Kaiser Permanente. Okay, so like, okay, they're, they're in pretty good places to be like, maybe we need to do this thing differently, right? But there were over 200 people on the Oakland call last Friday. I think all of those people, if all of us decided to do things differently, we are also in a remarkably strong position to do things differently and to really shift a current here and there. All right, Anna and Folletti. What if we're not asking the right questions? What if it's not as simple as understanding that smoking is bad for you or you need to exercise to lose weight, right? So they developed, there was a 10 question survey retrospective before the age of 18, did any of the, one of these things happen, right? They looked at physical um, abuse, psychological abuse, and Becky, help me out. Physical abuse, psychological abuse, um, and then Marshall. household dysfunction. Um, psychological would have been the emotional neglect piece. Um, all right, so, so 10 questions. Did this happen? Yes or no? They didn't care about duration at the time, right? It was just this retrospective study, not about duration, not about intensity, not about the number of times, none of those things. Did it happen? Yes or no? And what they found was that with the greater adversity, right, stress dose before the age of 18, the likelihood of having some kind of health problem increased. And these are the kinds of health problems that they saw. So it wasn't just things like alcoholism or drug abuse or depression or anxiety, things like cancer and cardiovascular disease. Yes, alcoholism and chronic depression, but asthma, diabetes, risk for HIV, currently smoking. So the question really becomes why, right? I think we can all so why, right? We might be able to make up a reason, pretty easy reason, right? When I'm stressed, I might feel like drinking more. I was smoked when I was younger, right? I would smoke more when I was stressed. So, so we can, we can, I think we can all find examples in our own lives of why, right? Back to this, hold on, let's find it. Back to this guy, <laughs> detox, <laughs> right? <laughs> like we all have a tendency to escalate whatever that stress coping behavior is when we're under high amounts of stress, okay? But why, why things like cardiovascular disease? What do you guys think? Well, all that stress, um, as we talked about the cortisol at heightened levels, if that doesn't go back down to normal, that eventually changes the physiological parts of our body. That's awesome. And that's exactly right, right? So, so cortisol is a diurnal bump in the morning to get us going really, really good, really completely necessary. Cortisol as a chronic ever-present substance in our physiology starts to wreck all kinds of havoc across multiple tissue systems and physiological systems that end up resulting in things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, asthma, diabetes, right? It just puts a consistent pressure on a physiological system that is outside of kind of like the, the normal normative homeostatic range or that that nice little balance that our bodies like to live in mm -hmm. and so what do we do right so aces live right so so to tom's point right aces exist not only from an individual kind of in-home unit but aces live on a community level as well right and we have to so so it's so it's really really complicated Right? And it's really, really easy to be like, man, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna go drink. We can't do that, right? Can't do that. I love my kids too much. I'm not gonna do that. And so here's the lofty goal, right? Is this idea of, of, of self-healing community. But just like we talked about, we'll talk about it again in a second, right? That, that it starts with ourselves. It starts with being honest about ourselves, right? What are, the, what are the things that we probably still need to pay a little bit more attention to, do a little bit more healing around? Um, who can we turn to for support for those kinds of conversations? Right? Because it's, it's hard enough to show up for other people in 2020 based on all of our kind of normal socialization, but it's even harder to do that if we haven't taken care of ourselves. So the self-healing community, is not just this selfless thing for our community, but it's also to take care of us better too. 
And this is one of my favorite quotes. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. 2020 has become a tinderbox of racial tension because for what, almost 400 years, if you have a dark color of skin in the United States of America, even before it was the United States of America, you have been marginalized and disenfranchised legally up until Fair Housing Act of 1967, 1968. Right? But we don't talk about the fact that all of the, like the all of the, the, the hatred, right? All of and it doesn't have to be explicitly hatred, but all of that distrust is still very much alive and well. in different racial communities, right? Most common way people give up their powers by thinking they don't have any. It's really easy if you lived marginal in a marginalized way. I have no idea clearly what it's like to live as a black person. I've been white and female my entire lifetime. I, I use she, her pronouns, right? Like, like I'm not marginalized. I have had experiences with marginalization. I have had experiences, right? These, these opportunities for insight into what it might be like to live a life in which nobody listens to my voice, where my voice is completely dismissed or disregarded. Right? And I imagine that everybody on the call has had an experience that might allow them to provide that in insight. And so it really is, and even if we look at something like Maslow's hierarchy, it says, boy, if we wanna get people on their feet, we, we have to solve poverty first. And that's like, <laughs> talk about an overwhelming, <laughs> charge, right? I don't know how to do that, but I do know a whole lot about neuroscience. And if anything that we've learned, and I mean, if anything has been helpful at all for anybody on any of these calls in the last five weeks, then that's worth something, right? Every single one of you has spheres of influence, the people that turn to you for your skill set, that's worth something, right? We all have a tremendous amount of power right? Not from a presidency position, but just from like a human common good position. Right? So how can we take our skill set and offer it far more broadly than historically we have? And this idea of trauma-informed is one of those ways, right? And in an alignment with kind of the body keeps the score. And um, did anybody read the epilogue? How many people run the epilogue, right? So if you haven't read the epilogue, I would, I would love you to read the epilogue. Um, maybe he calls it choices, choices to be made. I think he might call it choices to be made. Let me. Well, yes. The epilogue could well, almost have been a whole different chapter because it talks yeah. about everything in education. Yeah, so the, right, is this epilogue choices to be made? If you haven't read it, or even if you have read it, I would, I would offer that after going through this series, you participated in the Oakland, series as well, that epilogue might be able to be read with completely different eyes and a completely different heart because the epilogue is our call to action as a community around trauma-informed care, around self-healing communities. It is, it's all of those things. It's the educational system. It's, it's, the, it's community violence. It, I mean, it's, it's all of those things to say like, like we have we have all of this information. What if we just did something crazy and forgot all about what we want and focused on the needs of children, right? Like what if I got out of my own space and out of my own political view and out of my own frame? And I was just like, you know what? What, what, do, these what do these kids need from me? What do these kids need from an educational system. What do these kids need from a whatever? What if we? What if we just? But you're talking to like people. I mean, that first full paragraph on page 350, he lists the things that if we could do that as a society, it would be great. Mm -hmm. But we've been limited, I think, by a, a white male dominated. And you said yes, you've been a white woman your entire life, but that doesn't mean that you haven't had sexist um issues with male colleagues so it kind of comes down to me as a, a will white males get out of the way of those ideas on that page to allow these other improvements to happen and we yeah. still have a huge discourse in the country about some some people would read that and say yeah there's no problem with that yeah and 
So, so I wonder though, so I guess I don't, I don't, I don't, when I read this, I would offer that I don't, I don't read it as anybody being, I didn't take it as anybody getting, being told to like, get out of the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we could, maybe we could talk about, maybe we could talk about that sometime offline um, or, or, you know, not, not in this particular venue, because that will kind of take us, like, we can park on that and come back to it. Um, but the way that I read that epilogue is that like, that we need, we need everybody. Like we need, we need all hands on deck, all boots on the ground, like every, right. So trauma informed this is a strength-based framework. Every single person in our community has something to offer to help us to help us get to the other side of this, to help heal, because, because, right? I don't, I don't know what it's like to be anybody else but myself, right? I think we know what's out there and what can happen, but I guess my question is, and I think we're making progress as a community. And like I said, the the group that Becky's putting together with St. Joe County Cares is continuing to grow, and and that's a tremendous group. We and time's not on our side, but we need more of it. We need more collaboration. We need more people to lean into this. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do we, how, so how do we, we, right, through this group, through SJC Cares, um, through the source, how do we, how do we become kind of, kind of community leaders and not necessarily in the sense of an organizational way, but in the sense of, of being able to have the courage to speak up. Right? Because even just that small shift is tremendously hard, right? To say like maybe maybe this isn't maybe this isn't good enough, right? So from a trauma trauma informed framework, right? I think I think you're right. Right. One of the things that that Becky and I've talked about um, is that is that through kind of the this book series and the Oakland series, we we really have we've come a long way as a community. I mean, we really really have. It might not feel like it, but awareness is the first step because otherwise we don't even know that there's anything to be talking about. Right? I think that there is enough awareness that people are really looking for an actionable what to do next. What do we what do we do from here? Right. And I think Tom, that sounds like what what you're what you're getting to is that there's you're right. We have a lot more to do. Right. So so trauma sensitivity and trauma sensitivity leads to trauma responsiveness, leads to right when an organization is trauma informed, but a self-healing community right, kind of works through all the steps, maybe on an individual standpoint. So wanting to highlight this idea of trauma sensitive, really, I think for, for me, it's, it's about changing a heart. It's about saying like, I am the least important thing. I'm the least important factor in this conversation. I wanna be able to offer my skills. I wanna be able to offer my time, but in so many environments, I have no idea what the right thing to do is. I need you to tell me what your experience has been. What, you know what I mean? Like, like, I need somebody to tell me what to do. I need to learn a whole lot more. And then together we can figure out maybe if my, like how my skills can help, but I'm also really good at filing paper. So if that's what you need me to do, I'm totally cool with that, right? Um, here's my bias again. I think neuroscience, right? It offers kind of a frame shift in, um, in, in the way that we can approach a conversation, right? If we talk about kind of developmental expectations and less about, not less about the social issues, but right, it's really easy, I think in 2020 to get into an argument over a social issue, right? But if we all care about our community and if that can be the common starting point, right? We can keep the conversation focused on, right? Expectations of the nerve, like what do we, what do we understand about physiology and and developmental neuroscience. Because we can all be <laughs> better protective factors, right? Back to kind of the long game of humans, um, right? Protective factors are generally people and they're generally free, right? So, so that's, that's, a really, that's a really easy, so what do we do? Tom, I don't know what we do, but I, but I, but I don't wanna, quit on that. I want to keep asking that question. I want to ask different people that question because um, there's a lot of representation that needs to be a part of this conversation that I would be willing to place a very large bet that is not on this call nor was part of the Oak Lawn series, right? You know what I mean? Like, like there are a lot of voices in the community that, ju that just need 
need to be heard. Um, but but showing up as a human is a, is a pretty good is a pretty good free first step, I think. Right? We can all be better protective factors for ourselves and for other people. And this is part of this tiny story, right? Like, so how can we to be better protective factor for myself? I should probably get more sleep. Should probably just have a permanent out of office on my email saying, I get too much email. There's no way I can respond to every single one of them. If it's actually important and I haven't responded, send me another email in a week, right? Like, <laughs> so there are, there are all of these things that we can do for ourselves that allow us, right? When we can de-stress ourselves, we have much more bandwidth to be present for others. And that is what leads us to a self-healing community, right? It's a strength-based, it's trauma-informed. We all engage as protective factors. And out of that emerges not only resilient individuals, but a resilient community. And resilience, right? Because resilience is our human behavior. Human existence has never been easy. It's about where, where we sit on this, on this teeter-totter. Right. The, with, for positive outcomes or protective factors to outweigh those negative experiences, it's not the absence of adversity at all. Right. It's it's how do we show up differently for others? Um, how do we show up differently for others? The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. I feel so overwhelmed sometimes. When I, when, I, when I look at this, right? Because, right, psychological needs, I need to be able to food and water and pr to provide shelter for and like a good place to sleep before somebody can ever feel safe so that they can create, right, these things. But I would say from a strength-based perspective and from a developmental neuroscience perspective, this might look a little different. So this is my, this is my hierarchy. <laughs> um, that that if we look at this from a strength, from a protective factor standpoint, and from right this this kind of modulation of oxytocin in the privileged position over dopamine, from a from a developmental neuroscience perspective, those are the factors, right? It's not that the world was ever safe, but that I was reliable for you. That is what created your sense of safety when you were younger, and one of my primary jobs as a caretaker is to be consistent enough for my children that no matter what is happening in a post George Floyd coronavirus era, that I am consistent enough and accessible enough that they can know about all these things, but they still feel safe. That their sense of safety arises from my consistency in their life. And we can do that, right? Every single one of us can be better at that for the people in our lives. And this is a really, really different message because once you feel stabilized in terms of, right, this can be a conversation for another time too. The way that stress systems shift brain function, right? When I am feeling stressed, so let's go back here. When I am feeling stressed, right? If I don't have enough food, water, if I'm tired, if I'm cold, right? If I'm unsafe, if I don't have that resources, if the demands on my agency exceed the resources that I have available, then I am helpless, then I am stressed. But what attachment, this neural circuitry of attachment really shows us is that safety arises from attachment, right? Internal sense of safety, internal sense of agency autonomy, right? That arises from human to human relationship, right? That my presence for you or someone else's presence for me can relieve my stress response. And when my stress response is relieved, I then cognitively have access to all of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex area, cortical areas, right? That would allow me to participate in problem solving in my own life. And once I'm able to participate in problem solving in my own life, instead of being dependent upon somebody else, right? That is where I also begin to develop my own sense of agency 
my own sense of autonomy, my own sense of control, my own kind of internal locus of control. And, and that, right, like that's a, for me, I offer it to you all. I'd love to hear your thoughts, tear it apart. Um, but like, but, but that is, that is a, that is, I can do something with this, right? This is, this is a, this is, this is something that's, that's based in, in attachment circuitry and developmental neuroscience. And I can, I can be a, I could be a better person, right? And so when we think about communities as systems, we can, we can think about, right? The, the most common way people give out their power is by thinking they don't have any, but if my power is just me showing up, right? Like that's, that could, that could be, that could be all of our superpower, right? Us showing up differently in a courageous and vulnerable way to say like, I don't have it all figured out, but I care about this community and I care about you. And I wanna, I wanna be helpful, but I don't know how to do that until you tell me what you need, until you tell me, tell me your story, I, let, let me listen. Um, that systems, right? This last weekend was heartbreaking. We are interacting, interacting systems, right? If something happens in one part of the community, it's not isolated to that part of the community. It sends a ripple effect through the entire community. And again, depending on the relationship, right? Depending on the relationship you have, you might be reasonably well, in, reasonably well insulated from the impact. But even, right? So when we feel threatened, when we hear about something, if it's not in our immediate, how do I say this? Um, sometimes we just withdraw, right? If, if there is something that is just too big, we just don't know how to deal with it, we run the risk of removing ourselves from the situation, right? We can do that in our hearts. We can do that with our resources. We can do that with our address, right? Many people, perhaps on this call, perhaps, right? Like people with resources, can always just move further away. That does not solve anything, nor does it maintain um, a full human capacity for love and for attachment. But communities are, right? We are, with their dynamic and their living systems. So when thinking about how to, how do we change, right? How do we add another cog to this wheel to influence the momentum and the directionality and the interconnectivity, right? And this is an active process. So like, please do this, do this at your organization, do this at your family, do this with other agencies or places that you work with, right? Because this is where we're at right now in the self-healing communities effort. Right? What does what does our community look like? What is our dynamic system? And what what organizations interface with others? Where is the influence? Right? The education system, man. They they get to interface with everybody. The public library system. They right. Very few organizations or organizational structures from a community standpoint actually get to have the opportunity to engage with citizens at large. Right. They have to be a part of this process, right? Got that, Sarah? <laughs> right? Like, um, so, so what is what does this look like for our, what does this look like for our community, right? And a theory of change, right? We have this lofty goal of a self healing communities, right? Where 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 we all, right? It's not just Oaklawn. It's not just Beacon. It's not right. It's not just these big organizations that we turn to to solve our problems. So we all have the capacity and the confidence and the courage and the skills, right? And again, my bias in all of this is neuroscience, clearly. We all have the capacity and the confidence and skills to, to be better at meeting nervous system expectations. So what do kids need? Complex three-dimensional environments. All right, that means that it might be irritating, but my kids can't be watching TV all of the time. It might be irritating, and I know that this is supposed to be a great educational game, but maybe we'll get you a box and some leaves or something, right? 
Okay, fine. So change theory. That's my bias. I'm okay. Great. Up front. Change theory is just, it's a map right? Where are we? Where do we want to go? It sets a direction for an individual, for an organization, or for a community. And if we are mapping two different goals, then, then it's hard, right? Then it's hard to coordinate. But if we can agree on a common community goal of like, let's take better care of our kids, right? If we can, right, here's my, here's my lofty goal. A self-healing community can be our community. It's a community which organizations, community members, have the requisite knowledge, understanding, and skills to take care of themselves and each other in the ways that humans need and the nervous system expects to be taken care of. We can start creating an individual map. Pick your favorite one. What's your favorite thing? What's the thing that you know you need to work on? What's the thing that you have always wanted to do? Pick one, right? And you create a map to set a direction for an individual, an organization, or community. For communities, right, we have to have an interconnected coalition that is owned by no one and led by everyone. Sounds really easy. <laughs> All right, so that's a map. All right, but here it is. So take a minute, right? Discuss what either, you know, what is your thing for you? What is your thing for an organization? What is the thing for community? What would be the thing that motivates, right? If there's one thing that you wanna change or one thing you wanna do differently, Take a minute, write to yourself, what motivates that change, right? That internal driver, what, what is the motivation for that? All right, what'd you guys come up with? What's the, super simple, what's the, what's the thing and then what's the motivation? And you can even just say like individual organization and then, you know, if you don't wanna share the specifics. I said for community, uh, I just, I wrote this down when you brought this up on Friday too, um, really having a soul to understand the fact of historical injustice and a willingness to be part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very courageous one too. Thank yeah. you, Tom. Can you tell what motivates that one? So that's the goal, but what's the motivation behind it? We could spend a couple hours on that, I guess. <laughs> you got like 10 seconds. No, okay. Well, it, it, there's just too much wrong out there. We, we got to make it better. Yeah. And we can. Yeah. Well, for me, um, the motivation is stop the suffering. There's too many people out there that are suffering. Sometimes it's an individual suffering and sometimes it's a collective one. And one of the slides you had in the slide that you talked about needs, uh, your last statement on there is uh, that one of the needs is to meet community expectations. It's sometimes, I, I think of the people that get involved in violence and things like that, they, become part of a community that has expectations that don't work. And they become part of that community. They sort of back into it. They aren't getting their needs met. Terrible things are happening. And um, I'm struck by the Homeboys Industries. It's a national uh, program. And just the 
tremendous amount of work that they're doing with people who have, who previously had adopted a set of community expectations they were trying to meet that were really dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And they're helping them in really concrete ways to change their lives so that they have a mutual set of community expectations where people don't hurt people and those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. and I would, I would offer that I, in, in my, my very humble and reasonably uninformed opinion, um, I think people like um, Isaac Hunt and Kenneth Lee and Deb Stanley and by the, right, that we have, we have a number of people in this community that do that work here as well. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how do we, how do we support that good work that's already happening, that's already happening here? Yeah. But there's also, we have to also work at the level of the community expectations so that we shape a large, a, a broad community expectation that, that allows everybody to buy in. Yep. So we don't have people that choose not to buy in. Yeah, yeah. Like what if, what if, what if when I said, I do this for our kids, not just my kids, right? Like, like what, what if, what if that was just, that was, that was believed, right? Because I think, right, I think that's why like not only history of ourselves, but kind of longer, longer game history is because, because that's not trusted, right? I have to earn that for lots of different reasons in lots of different community settings, um, right? I'm white, I'm a Notre Dame professor, it, right? It took, me, it took me about six months to figure out that like Notre Dame can either get me a best friend or it's a real big barrier to overcome in cultivating a relationship with people in this community, with, with anybody in this community, right? And that has to do with community history. Um, yeah, and so, so I, think, I think you're right, Mary, Cult but cultivating trust, right? Like establishing, right, the consistency of showing up to say that this isn't, this isn't something that I'm saying and offering and then I'm gonna take it away. Right. When, when and right. bringing people to your point before of listening, what do people in the community need and how can we shape expectations so that people can get that and live harmoniously in the process? Yeah, yeah. A really interesting, maybe a next relevant reads. Um, I started reading a book called The Strange Order of Things and the, the, the thesis really is, is that all of the everything is driven by homeostasis, which I'm totally loving. Um, but it's, it's a fast, I mean, it's, it's so good. I'll finish it over my winter, uh, winter session. I'll finish it over winter session. All right. So we all have these things, right? They can be individual, they can be community, they can be organization level. And so for change theory, right? If this is the goal, then we build the map backwards, right? Because we don't know what it's gonna look like. And I think like planning in these kinds of situations is a terrible idea because inevitably the plan isn't gonna work because communities are dynamic living systems. And if we set a plan that's supposed to have the long game goal of 10 years from now, inevitably we're not gonna be able to stick to that plan because the community is gonna be different next week, right? So change theory works with really flexible models, right? So the, if the goal is, you know, agency, meeting the needs of children, everybody, you know, empowered, then what does that look, so what does that look like right before then? What organizations, what neighborhoods, what community leaders, what are the policies, what are the, and what comes right before that? Okay, so that's probably, right, if we need everybody on board, then then maybe the, the justice system needs to be working in its own lane, and the educational system needs to be doing its thing, but those guys are definitely interconnected. So how do they intervene? And then how do health services and family services, right? So it's it's top down, bottom up and everything in between in this kind of iterative cycle. And I think one of the things, I know it's Becky's favorite thing to do is measure something, right? Because once you kind of have this path, it's not a plan, it's a strategy. It's this vision, it's a common shared vision of what it can look like then we have to start at the very beginning, right? So in terms of trauma awareness, how many people have we trained? How many people see the world slightly differently? How many people have a little bit more sense of agency or hope, right? What can be, from these very entry level places, what can be measured to demonstrate that we're making progress on our long game goal? Because if we wait for 
high school graduation rates to change, guess how many people are gonna stop playing about a year in, right? So what is, what is that, what are those incremental goals? Not only, right, for ourselves too, right? What are those incremental goals? So identify the very, very most proximal strategy, the individual behavior, the organizational structure, the whatever it is, right? And what are you going to be doing differently? What is the target of that strategy, right? This year, Autumn's on this call, this year I did doing differently in class. So not only we had to figure out this online thing, right? But doing differently in class, we're gonna be concept mapping every, that's their, that's their proof of whatever. But the specific that it's not just that we're doing concept mapping, that's the strategy, but the students are gonna be doing concept mapping right after every class between session one and session two, between session two and session three. And that the impact, right, would be increased learning gains and increased depth of understanding. And then I would have to assess that in some way, right? So what, is the, what do those end of semester assessments look like based on this new strategy compared to years before? right? It's incremental, right? It's, it's generally one thing. We can't change 12,000 things all at the same time because then we don't know what we're, where, where's the, where's the effective step. And so we can do, we can do another like session on this at some point in time, but, but this is, this is, this is the good stuff, right? And it's got to be incremental and we've got to start where we're at, right? Thank goodness to Beacon and Oaklawn, United, right? Like the libraries, we have, we have so many good people we have so many good people. We have so many boots on the ground. It was so hopeful. Friday was one of the most hopeful days, hopeful mornings for me that I've had in a long time. Cause there were over 200 people on a, on a Zoom conference. Like that's amazing. It's amazing, right? We have so much momentum. So how can we capture it? How can we deliver skills, deliver hope, offer hope, participate in creating and cultivating hope? Um, yeah, and so here's, right? And it starts, it starts with us, right? If, we, if we, we have to be able to show up honestly for ourselves so that we can show up honestly for other people. And again, neuroscience is my bias, right? Like I think if we just look to the evidence of neuroscience and like took care of kids and humans the way that the nervous system expects, I think we could do a lot of, a lot of good really, really rapidly just by seeing ourselves as, as change agents in this process by increasing our capacity to provide ourselves as a protective factor to others. So thank you guys so much. It's been a long, long game and I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. That's like, that's such a great guide there. I need to like put that poster on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> So that concludes our series about the body keeps the score. I hope that you've learned some things and had a chance to connect with some new people. Um, we'll post the recordings on that same website and um, you know follow all of the organizations involved to find out what we're doing next. I know that everybody is working on things all the time. So have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very so much. All right. Thanks, Sarah, for organizing. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Have a good night. Awesome. Thanks. You too. Take care. You too.